This program was produced in partnership with the Louisiana Purchase Bicentennial Committee of Arkansas, supported in part by a grant from the Arkansas Humanities Council, the Department of Arkansas Heritage, and by the Arkansas Secretary of State's Office. Additional support provided by the Arkansas Community Foundation, the Butler Foundation, and the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation. It started here. In this headwater swamp in the autumn of 1815, two federal land surveying teams met and marked the initial point for the territory of Louisiana. In a remote delta region of eastern Arkansas, a historic state park commemorates the spot where the surveyors established a starting point, a datum, for land surveys of the states of Arkansas, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, and the Dakotas. It's very important to understand that from this little obscure spot in the corner of three counties in Arkansas, the rest of the lands of the Louisiana Purchase, all the way to the Canadian border, are surveyed and tied to this spot. It's a big deal. And without it, uh, our whole system of, uh, of land ownership, which is critical to the way that the free United States of America operates, uh, in terms of land ownership, that whole system would fall apart. The baseline extending from the swamp cuts through the heart of Arkansas and its capital city. Every day, thousands of automobiles travel along Baseline Road in Little Rock. But most of these motorists have no clue as to the origin of the name of this busy street. For more than 100 years, the survey marker lay hidden and forgotten underneath the leaf litter of the same tall cypress trees where the surveyors camped. In 1921, the point was re-established when a new surveying team using the 1815 notes found the original blaze marks. But uh, when I set up at this corner, I saw quite a distance, oh, probably two or three hundred feet over there. Uh, this little tree that had a snarl in this uh, wet place. And there was a corner uh, put down in 1815. A monument erected in 1926 by the Daughters of the American Revolution recognizes what has become an obscure footnote in American history. The park is off the beaten path and like the story it honors, is not well known. At times, the granite headstone can barely be seen because for much of the year, it's submerged in swamp water. The reason they came together here is an accident of geography. You needed a, a datum point, a starting point for the surveys. And the two most fundamental, biggest, most stable landmarks in general that you could find in that area were the mouths of those two rivers. The echoes in the swamp are eerie. The sights and sounds of this place look and sound exactly the way they appeared to those federal land surveyors back in 1815. It's a walk back in time to a place where it all began.
The surveyors began their job 12 years after President Thomas Jefferson approved the purchase of Louisiana from Napoleon's France. It was the best real estate deal in American history, 880,000 square miles for $15 million, less than three cents an acre. Almost by accident, uh, American diplomats in Paris were able to purchase this huge amount of territory all of the territory uh, west of the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains, all of the territory drained by uh, rivers flowing into the Mississippi River. Jefferson bought an area sight unseen, so he wasn't exactly sure what he was getting and sending these surveyors out. They were really showing an American perspective of what the landscape was. The land survey was commissioned by President James Madison. The War of 1812 had been won, and a grateful yet financially strapped American government had promised its soldiers property in the new territory. Thanks to the Louisiana Purchase, the young nation had plenty of land to give away, but except for the area that became the state of Louisiana, none of it had been surveyed, and until it was marked off, could not be awarded as bounty to the war veterans. Two federally deputized land surveyors, Prospect Robbins and Joseph Brown, were hired to establish the initial point. Their job was to survey two million acres of fertile land that could be rewarded to those soldiers who went to battle, banking on promised land west of the Mississippi. I do solemnly swear that I will truly and faithfully, to the best of my ability, perform the duty of surveyor in measuring the land of the United States in which business I am about to be employed. So help me God. Prospect Robbins, surveyor. And so the pressure was on the surveyors after the War of 1812 to get out and subdivide this land, get it marked off into blocks, into sections and quarter sections, so that they could give the typical enlisted man a quarter section of 160 acres. Brown and his team started their survey at the mouth of the St. Francis River and began bushwhacking their way west, covering about four miles a day. They crossed the hilly country of Crowley's Ridge and into the Cypress Tupelo wetlands. Robbins and his team began tramping north from the mouth of the Arkansas River. They slogged through sloughs and bayous and crossed the meandering Mississippi River six times. They hacked their way through thickets and briars, fending off cottonmouth snakes and mosquitoes. At night, they slept in tents in the dense wilderness. The crews consisted of the surveyor, an ax man, two chain men, a tree blazer, a cook, and a game hunter. For their labor, each team was paid $2 a surveyed mile and paid only when the job was done. The most fundamental piece of equipment they used was a compass. And uh, the compass gave them direction, because without direction, you're lost. The 66-foot chain is a very ingenious system in that it divided the mile into 80 pulls of the chain. Chain! They had to blaze the trees, mark the lines, and record the trees as they went through. They recorded essentially every piece of information that they could assemble about the geography and the terrain and the, uh, the conditions of the land. October 27, 1815. This mile over very low lands, mostly canebrake, the growth, cottonwood, sweet gum, and other lowland timbers. But a hurricane has passed over the last one half mile and left scarcely a tree of any sort standing. Joseph Brown, surveyor. Wetlands encompassed about 80% of the land they crossed over. It was a country abundant in black bear and huge flocks of birds later hunted to extinction. The passenger pigeon, 
and the Carolina parakeet. The Carolina parakeet actually resembled a parrot, very large beak. It had brightly colored feathers that were green and yellow that American Indians and settlers both coveted and used in their hats and used for decoration. If they would shoot one of these birds, then the other birds would flock to it. And so it was very easy to get rid of a whole flock of birds. On 5th Principal Meridian, intersected line, 26 miles and 30 chains west of the Mississippi, where we set a post corner, Prospect Robbins. On November the 10th, 1815, Brown and Robbins met and set a post to mark the intersection of the baseline and the 5th Principal Meridian. They laid out four townships, cutting blaze marks into trees, where the historical monument now stands. Arkansas and five other states were ultimately subdivided uh, in terms of the federal original subdivision of the lands uh, based on this one point. Despite the federal government's best intentions, only a few war veterans actually received their free land, and others were not able to hold on to it. Politicians taxed the land, and property holders who could not afford to pay the taxes lost their deeds. And most of that land was then uh, essentially, what, confiscated by the state of Arkansas and then sold at very low prices to, guess who, politicians and landowners in Arkansas. Before the survey, Americans in the East first began reading about the land that would become Arkansas from published reports of a journey by two Scottish immigrants who explored a river known as the Washita. From the fall of 1804 to the winter of 1805, Mississippi plantation owner William Dunbar, Philadelphia chemist George Hunter, a crew of soldiers and a slave poled a flat boat up the river to the hot springs. It's the first report about this new frontier. But probably their reports open up the curiosity for Americans, uh, not just to the hot springs, but to the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, the same way Lewis and Clark, hey, look what's here, come and get it. At the time of the Louisiana Purchase, there were only a few white settlements west of the Mississippi. The oldest of these frontier trade centers was Arkansas Post. Established in the summer of 1686 on the Arkansas River, almost 80 years before St. Louis, the Post was a French-Canadian colony and served as a trading and military base until the end of the colonial period. This fertile lowland was the home of the Quapaw Indians, who befriended the French, the Spanish, and finally, the Americans. The French called them the Aucansay, meaning downstream people. A lot of the Americans called the Arkansas Indians the Ozark Indians, because the French called the Arkansas Post the Post Ozark. And so the name got transferred by the Americans to the Indians, and the uh, early American uh, expedition up the Arkansas River named the mountains the Ozarks after the tribe. The Quapaw grew squash, beans, and corn, and hunted buffalo and turkey. Throughout the territory, they were known for their artistry. I like to say that they were artisans, or anthropologists, archaeologists, we'll call them manufacturers, but they really got their subsistence by making these fabulous pots. They were known by the French for their dugout canoes. Everything they did was of a finer quality, I think, than a lot of other people that the French were dealing with. And a lot of the Indians would come in and trade with the Quapaw tribe. They had trade networks that ran all the way to New England on the one hand and down to Mexico on the other. So uh, the goods moved rather freely into this part of the world long before the white people were actually here. 
In 1804, just after the Louisiana Purchase, the United States government took possession of Arkansas Post. It was a melting pot, French, slaves, free blacks, and Indians. It's important to realize that uh, almost every class a person, white, black, and Indian, was represented in the social structure at Arkansas Post, even though it was a very small place, never more than a few hundred people. And in fact, uh, some of the early travelers said that the uh, French and the Indians here spoke a patois, that is a, a kind of separate and distinct language that was a mixture of French and Quapaw. So Arkansas Post stands as an example of how interracial and intercultural cooperation can occur. When Arkansas became a territory in 1819, Arkansas Post was named the capital, and a young printer, William Woodruff, began publishing the Arkansas Gazette newspaper. The Post was not centrally located. It was prone to flooding, and mosquitoes and malaria were a constant problem. So in 1821, the capital was moved to Little Rock, and over time, the once thriving trade post declined. In 1863, during a Civil War battle, the post was leveled by bombardment from federal cannons. While the town is gone, a state park and national monument remain, honoring the history of the first white settlement in the Louisiana Territory and the Indian tribe that gave a state its name. In the early morning hours of December 16, 1811, four years before the land survey, the most catastrophic earthquake in North American history shook Northeast Arkansas, Southeast Missouri, and Western Tennessee. The ground split open creating 20-foot deep cracks that ran five miles long. The banks of the Mississippi collapsed. Trees bowed over, and sand and gases poured out of the earth. It was of enormous power. Church bells rang in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. It was felt in Boston. It was felt in the uh, southernmost province of Canada. It was felt in New Orleans. The land ripped apart by the New Madrid earthquake was occupied by a few thousand Cherokee Indians. A Cherokee prophet by the name of Skakwa, which means the swan, um, was uh, very active in promoting the idea that the quake was a sign from the Great Spirit or the gods that Indians had gone wrong in trying to uh, assimilate with whites. Hey. Warned by the prophet that another quake was coming to punish white pioneers, the Cherokees moved southwest and settled in the Arkansas River Valley near the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. Here, their culture ran head on into the Osage Indians. The Cherokee can't find uh, enough game and they push further to the north and to the west onto the land that the Osage still controlled. And uh, next thing you know, you've got a full-blown war going on uh, out here on the Arkansas River between two groups of people. On a cold December day in 1817, a company of the U.S. Rifle Regiment, the best soldiers in the Army, arrived in keelboats from Arkansas Post and established a fort to keep peace between the warring tribes. Fort Smith was a small log and stone stockade, hastily built on a bluff overlooking the confluence of the Arkansas and Poto Rivers. It was a lonely and isolated station, never housing more than 130 soldiers. The garrison, consisting of two blockhouses and lines of cabins or barracks for the accommodations of 70 men, is agreeably situated. The view is more commanding and picturesque than any other spot of equal elevation on the banks of the Arkansas. Thomas Nuttall, 1819. For about seven years from 1817 to 1824, the fort is established. It is successful in its mission. Uh, the unique thing about it is, with the exception of a couple of isolated incidents, uh, they don't have to shoot to, uh, to stop the fighting. This little outpost in the middle of, of nowhere stopped a war. In 1822, 
Territorial leaders negotiated a peace treaty between the Osage and Cherokee. Two years later, the army abandoned the garrison. Some of the soldiers decided to stay and settle in the Fort Smith area on surveyed land deeded to them as veterans of the War of 1812. The same year the Army left Fort Smith, the Arkansas territorial government decided the Quapaw had outlived their usefulness. The Aborigines of this territory, now commonly called the Arkansas, or Quapaws, or Ozarks, do not at this time number more than about 200 warriors. Thomas Nuttall, botanist. They were reduced in numbers, and they were the geographical irritants of the territory. Quapaw Chief Hecaton pleaded with the territorial governor to allow his people to stay in Arkansas. To leave my native soil and go among red men who are alien to our race is throwing us like outcasts upon the world. Have mercy. Send us not there. Hecaton, Quapaw. Hecaton's pleas were ignored and the Quapaw signed a treaty and moved to the Southwest, joining the Caddo on the Red River in Louisiana. And the Quapaws died, I think about a third of the tribe died of starvation, living with the Caddos. The lands that they were put on flooded, uh, provisions didn't come through, and a lot of the Quapaws escaped back into Pine Bluff. But the Quapaw were not welcomed back. In 1835, one year before statehood, the Akansay Indians were removed to the northeast corner of Oklahoma, where to this day, tribal members make their home. The territory of Arkansas included the present-day states of both Oklahoma and Arkansas. In 1836, when Arkansas was admitted to the Union as the 25th state, Oklahoma was cut off becoming Indian Territory. <laughs> 187 years after the original land survey, modern-day surveyor Bill Ruck led a group of history buffs and government officials on an expedition that followed the baseline chained by Joseph Brown and his team in 1815. They started at the mouth of the St. Francis River and for three days hiked through marshy bogs and climbed over the steep hills of Crowley's Ridge, passing ancient blaze marks along the same 25-mile path recorded in Brown's journal. Yeah, now that's what they commented on. They commented on the briars, but they didn't comment on the <laughs> change of terrain. Now, every now and then they'd say, okay, we're at the bottom of a ravine or we're at the crest of the ridge. But that's all they'd say. It wasn't like, this is really bad steep in here. Located in a rural, out-of-the-way place, the Louisiana Purchase Historic State Park has been preserved as a national landmark. Uh, this was, we thought, sort of a historic occasion, and I'm glad so many of you are here that have an interest in that, in that history. Who you are. What we just did is, is accomplish something that can only be accomplished in this part of the world, and that is to be able to walk in the footsteps, literally in the footsteps of a historic journey. memorialized here could have occurred anywhere west of the Mississippi River. But of all possible places, 
The Louisiana Purchase Survey began in remote eastern Arkansas in a swamp between the mouths of the Arkansas and St. Francis Rivers. And having established that point, you see, then you could go on and, uh, and, and basically continue the, the survey, essentially, of the rest of the country. But you have to have a starting point, and that's what's critical about that spot over there uh, in the middle of that swamp. Lay your line both north and west across this swampy wilderness from Pawpaw Land to where Lakota roam. Wheels will turn and time will tell where tribe and settler finally dwell, but for millions yet to come this will be home. Starting here, we will measure all our prairies starting here. We'll take stock of all our hills from the marshes to the mighty Teton Mountains. Chain by chain, we'll mark our future starting here. This program was produced in partnership with the Louisiana Purchase Bicentennial Committee of Arkansas supported in part by a grant from the Arkansas Humanities Council, the Department of Arkansas Heritage, and by the Arkansas Secretary of State's Office. Additional support provided by the Arkansas Community Foundation, the Butler Foundation, and the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation. <laughs>